Hi, welcome to Games Made Easy. My name is Lavinia and this is Peter in our new set. Today I am very happy to teach you and give you some tips on how to play The Rise of X Expansion of Dune Imperium, designed by Paul Denon and published by Dyer Wolf. If you want to learn how to play the base game, watch my other video. And if you enjoy this video, consider subscribing and clicking the like button and the bell to get notified when I post new videos. It helps a lot. In this expansion, we are introduced to the planet Ix. The Ixians are known throughout the Imperium for their advanced technology, which is brought in this expansion as a new game mechanism. Chom is also a bit more developed in this expansion. We also have new factions and leaders, new units, and a lot more of every type of cards. These add a lot more ways to win the game, but without changing what was great about the base game. I'll show you first how to set up the game and how to add all the new elements into the base game. I'll start with the Chom board overlay, which you place on top of the original Landrad and Chom areas. It's different from the base game as we no longer have the Hall of Oratory and Rally Troop spaces. And instead of the two Chom spaces, we have two new shipping spaces and a shipping track you use to gain awesome rewards. Each player places one token at the bottom of the track here. It represents your freighter. I place the Mentat like before. Then place the X board next to the main board. Shuffle the 18 tech tiles face down, then divide them into three stacks of six tiles. Place the stacks on the three spaces here, then flip the top tile of each track. These will reveal the Ixian non-thinking machines through tech tiles. Rise of Ix introduces exciting dreadnoughts to increase your military strength. Place the two dreadnoughts in your supply with the other player components. There's also six new leaders from three new houses. When taking leaders, players may choose any combination of new or existing leaders. Add the four new conflict cards to create the conflict deck the same way as before. You should have a 10 card deck at the end, one conflict one card, five conflict two cards, and four conflict three cards. 27 new intrigue and 35 new Imperium cards are also added to their respective decks and used as in the base game. Now you're ready to play. Let me explain the new rules of this expansion. There are a few new icons in this expansion that we'll have a look at. We will start with discard. This icon means you pick a card from your hand, not an entry card, and place it on your discard pile. That discarded card or cards pays the cost to gain an effect. If you choose not to discard a card, you don't gain the effect. Another new icon is unload. The reveal boxes of some of the Rise of X cards are marked with an unload icon. This means that there are two additional ways to gain the effects of the reveal box. You can either use it during the reveal phase like any other card, or you can use it during the agent phase as the card you discard or trash. For example, if you discarded it when using the discard icon of your truth sayer, or trashed it when using the trash icon of your Shai Hulud card. What is also very cool is if you use the Guild Chief Administrator, you could first discard and gain the effect, and then trash it to gain the effect once more. Finally, there's Infiltration, a special agent icon. Some of the new Imperium cards have a partial profile of an agent. This means you may infiltrate an occupied board space. Enemy agents don't block your agent from being placed on a board space that shares the agent icon. You can't use infiltration to send a second agent to a space where you already have one. Infiltration does not allow you to ignore the effects of the voice card. If you use the entry card Dispatch and Envoy to add icons to a card that has infiltration, the new icons you add do not allow you to infiltrate. Now I'll explain how to control your freighter on the shipping track. For each freighter icon you trigger on a board space or card, you may move your freighter in one of two ways. You may either advance your freighter one space up on the shipping track, unless you're on the top space, or you may recall your freighter back to the bottom of the track. When you do, you collect all the shipping rewards associated with your freighter's current space and each space below it. This can be very powerful. This level gives a discount of two spice to purchase a tech tile, this level, you can recruit two troops and also gain an influence in any one of the four faction tracks. In this level, you have a choice. You either pick five Solari and all the other players gain one Solari, or you take two Spice. Now I'll explain how you play your Dreadnoughts. Each time you trigger the Dreadnought icon on a board space or a card, you may commission one Dreadnought. Take it from your supply and put it in your garrison. 
And if you're in a combat space, you may deploy it directly to the conflict. If you run out of dreadnoughts in your supply, you may not commission any more. I'm going to explain now the three special advantages dreadnoughts give you. Each dreadnought is worth three strength. They provide strength even if there are no troops in the conflict. Swords from reveal or intrigue cards count as usual. If you don't win the conflict, return your dreadnought to your garrison instead of your supply. If you win the conflict in which you had at least one dreadnought, you take control of one board space that does not have a dreadnought on it. Place your dreadnought on the flag below that space, covering any control marker that may already be there. If your second dreadnought was also in the conflict, you return that one to the garrison. While your dreadnought is at a location, you gain the bonus that would normally be given for a control marker. Your control lasts until the end of the next combat phase when your dreadnought returns to your garrison and control returns to the owner of the control marker your dreadnought may have been covering. Another exciting new component are the tech tiles. These provide players with the in technology and machines. There are 18 of them and can give you a great edge. Let's have a look at them. Here's the spice cost of the tech. Here are the name of it and the immediate effect when you acquire it. This is the ability of the technology. And lastly here, these are techs that rivals can use in a solo game. Whenever you see the tech icon, you may acquire one tech tile from the X board. You may acquire as many as you want, so it can be really powerful. When you acquire a tech, choose one of the face up tiles, pay the cost shown here and place it in front of you visible to all players. Turn the new available tile face up now. There are two ways to reduce the cost of a tech tile, but it can never be less than zero. When the acquire icon appears with a minus one or minus two spice, the cost of that single purchase is reduced by that amount of spice. Tech navigation is another way to reduce the cost of the tech tile. Each time you see this icon on a board space or a card, you may take one of your troops from your supply and place it as a negotiator on the X board here. Later, when you use the acquire tech icon, you may return any number of your negotiators from the X board to your supply to get a discount of one for each troop returned. You may also combine this with a tech discount. Tech tiles offer a variety of abilities that work throughout the game. Let's have a look at them in more detail. Some work at the start of the round, some during the agent phase. This icon shows you you can use the tech once per round. Once you've used it, you just flip it face down. At the start of the next round, you flip it back face up to use it again. Those you can use during your reveal turn and some at the end of the conflict. And finally, some take effect at the end of the game like these, but also this one. Let me show you the six new leaders and their exciting new powers that incorporate some of the new elements in the expansion. Via Cap Moritani's Signet ability, you spend a spice to activate your freighter. Prince Vernius's Signet ability gives Acquire Tech or One Tech Negotiator. Tessia Vernia starts with four Snoopa tokens. These let you gain additional influence bonuses every time you collect them. During the game, when you reach that level, collect the Snoopa token and place it on the lowest uncovered level of this bonus track. The first time gain the track bonus and one influence, the second is one influence, the third just the bonus, and the fourth you discard one card to gain one spice. The other leaders are quite straightforward. Now let me show you the four new conflict cards, which are pretty cool. These two level one cards activate your freighter, and this level two activates twice the freighter, plus lets you add a troop to your garrison, and the level three is just at another level. If you have the spice and Solari, it's epic. The new entry cards are exciting and gripping. Most are still plot cards, but you have a few more combos like plot or combat and um, plot or end game. Let's have a look at them. Some of the plot cards let you exchange something to gain something else, like one spice to activate your Fraser. The combat cards are very similar to the base game and the cards that can be used in different phases of the game offer some nice perks. The Grand Conspiracy Endgame card offers a very sweet reward if you can complete it. It's time I show you what's changed in the solo and two player rules of this expansion. For the solo and two player rules of the base game, watch my other video. Let's start with the setup of the House Hegel deck. There are nine new House Hegel cards. Before you shuffle them in, remove the four cards marked 1p for a two player game or the two cards marked 2p for a solo game. The new House Hegel cards send the rival agents to board spaces on the new X board and the new Chong overlay. If the Dreadnought card is revealed for a rival and the rival has two Dreadnoughts already, you skip it and reveal a new one. Like for the active players, interstellar shipping requires the rival to have two influence with the guild. If they do not have the two influences, they use the alternative. The shipping track works a bit differently in a solo and two player game. Rivals must keep going up until they reach the second level. They never get to the third level. 
Once they reach level 2, they must recall the freighter. In a solo game, they collect the two levels of rewards, always picking the Solari option here. In a two-player game, they only collect the second level reward. And if there's a tie in the faction which has the least influence, the player with the first player marker picks. In the solo game, the rivals both gain one Solari when the player takes dividends. Let's have a look at how the Dreadnoughts work. A rival will always deploy a Dreadnought over troops and will always send a Dreadnought to the conflict whenever it can. When a rival wins a conflict where it has used a Dreadnought, it must take control of a board space. It will cover an opponent's marker when possible and avoid covering its own. When there are multiple locations available, its first choice is the Imperial Basin, then goes counterclockwise to Arakeen, then Carthag as its last choice. If there is no player in Imperial Basin, and opponents control Arakeen and Karthag, a rival would send the Dreadnought to Arakeen. One last thing about the solo game, you can add two of the new leaders, Prince Romba and Viscount Moritani, to the base game leaders. When you want a longer and more intense game of Dune Imperium, go for the epic game mode. It's a great way to play with this expansion. I love the epic game. It's easy to learn because all the changes happen during setup. Start with a conflict deck where you do not use conflict one cards but instead build a Conflict deck with 5 Conflict 2 and 5 Conflict 3 cards. Each player removes one copy of Dune Desert Planet from the starting deck and replace it with Control the Spice. At the start, each player also draws an Intrigue card and you keep it face down on your supply. Finally, you garrison 5 troops instead of 3. The endgame is triggered when a player reaches 12 instead of 10 victory points. The endgame is resolved as in the base game. Now, my tips to win at Dune Imperium Rise of Ix are, have a look at my tips in uh, for the three and four player game because they all apply here too. Be flexible, even more so than in the base game because you have a lot more pathways to victory. Remember that you can return negotiators to pay less for tech tiles, but also that you can pay with a mix of Solari and Spice. Try to get the Dreadnoughts in play. They're not only powerful during conflict, but also when they are resting on location. Get two Spacing Guild influence quickly so you can ship twice almost every turn. Collecting a lot of Solaris early is just as powerful, if not more so, than in the base game. So that's how you play the Rise of X expansion of Dune Imperium. Like all great expansion, it adds some really new cool mechanisms. It makes the game richer and more exciting without complicating it or changing what worked well. If you've enjoyed this video, consider subscribing and clicking the like button. And if you enjoy my content, consider supporting me on Patreon. The link is right here. We'll make more games easy soon. Bye now.